Hello friends, how are we doing? I am well excited to bring you an old friend from the music industry today, and that is Janie Starling. We met touring in punk bands. Janie now works as part of Level Up, which is a feminist community campaigning for gender justice in the UK. They do some amazing work. Janie actually won a Kerrang Award more recently for her activism, so it was pretty cool to see her finally getting recognised for all the amazing work she does. I invited Janie on the podcast because she got hit really badly with long COVID. And COVID is an illness that somehow passed loads of people by or barely affected some people, but managed to actually turn into a long-term chronic illness for a lot of people. And it knocked Janie out for pretty much a year. So today we're chatting about how she worked through that, what changes she had to make to her life and how it affected her training as a powerlifter. Now I know a lot of the people that listen to this podcast and a lot of the people that I coach live with all sorts of different chronic illnesses or disabilities and they all always advocate for each other. But a lot of the time people that don't have those illnesses or those disabilities don't advocate for the people that do because of capitalism, ableism, But what we really get into here is how forms of deep rest, community, compassion and intentional movement can be so crucial to so many of us, especially people that live with chronic illness or disability. And a lot of you will know my history with endometriosis as well, Janie has it too, so we get into that a little bit. And before I start, if you want to join a movement community that is self-compassionate and won't guilt trip you for missing a workout, but will absolutely celebrate you for taking a rest day when you need it. I have some spaces for online coaching in Fuzz Culture Club. So fill in the form in the show notes and I'll get back in touch with you and we can figure out if it would be a good fit for you. Anyways, without further ado, here is Janie Starling. Janie, thank you so much for coming on my podcast today. We go way back. How are you doing? How's your day been? I'm good. I was trying to think when was the last time I saw you and my distinct memory is driving on tour with you circa 2017 singing the lyrics to my chemical romance I'm not okay. We probably did that. I don't remember that but we probably did that. (laughs) No but we didn't sing them. You like we were like speaking them line for line. It was very cute. I wonder why. (laughs) Why were we doing that? I love it. And that that sounds about right for me, to be honest. Um, So we met like through music and I remember you met me for a coffee one day when I was having a really hard time in London. And that was the first time that I really spoke to you outside of us just being at a gig or like playing on a festival together. Um, And yeah, I drove you and we sang My Chemical Romance, apparently. What are you up to now? Can you give us a bit of an intro? Yeah, sure. So I am the co-director of a feminist organisation called Level Up. We make cultural interventions around gender injustice. So I train journalists on how to report fatal domestic abuse. Uh, We're running a big campaign on ending the imprisonment of pregnant women. And we're doing a big push for big beauty brands like L'Oreal to take cancerous chemicals out of black hair products. So that's what I do. And I work out. (laughs) Nice. Yeah. And was it, am I right in saying that you got Love Island to remove some of their ads? So yes, we did. So 2018, excellent season of Love Island. I'm a big fan of the show. We all know what the kind of body type and aesthetic is on that show. And ITV in the ad breaks were showing, um, amongst other things, appetite suppressant pills called Skinny Sprinkles. Really, really unethical. So unethical. And they were also selling plastic surgery on payment plans. And it was like kind of being marketed at teenagers. It was like available 16 and up dependent. It was very odd. Wow. So we made the case that, you know, for a show, especially like that, where a lot of teenagers are watching and also just in general, I don't think anyone should be even selling appetite suppressant sprinkles, <laughs> let alone on national television in front of 3 million people every night. So yeah, we we campaigned to get rid of those ads and they scrapped them. Hell yeah. And now now they were sponsored by like Just Eat or something quite recently, weren't they? Right. And I was just like, I shipped that, like because going from yeah. going from like appetite suppressants to eat your takeaway, they're great. <laughs> like uh, exactly that. going from don't eat <laughs> to actually yeah, eat something. So today we're gonna talk about long COVID and about powerlifting. So to begin with, when did you first get COVID and 
how how did that affect you? So I got COVID two years ago, two years and two weeks ago. It was the summer of 2021 and I got the Delta variant, which was renowned for being a very strong COVID variant. I was totally knocked flat by it. And essentially it it took me out for about six months, completely out for six months. I was off work. I had extreme fatigue, brain fog, muscle aches. Couldn't really stand up and get in the shower without feeling dizzy and my heart racing and needing to just lie down. And yeah, it's it's been a real slow journey of of getting back into exercise and just completely recalibrating the way I've, I'm living my life. And lifting was always a big part of my life before. And it kind of took me out, of, COVID took me out of the gym for a sustained period. But I've gradually found my way back and I'm excited to talk to you about it. That must have been so, so hard being out for six months. I caught it once that I know of, obviously. I mm-hmm. could have had it before, who knows. But it definitely didn't affect me in any of the same way. But I have had a lot of friends and I've read from a lot of people who are still suffering with long COVID symptoms and it's still happening, even though people think it's over. It's really nice to have someone on to talk about it. Tell me, what did your what was like your training looking like before this, before it wiped you out? So my training, so I was, I mean, I was in a touring punk band, so I was doing cardio without realizing yep. that it was cardio. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping around singing like 210 BPM punk songs, like it's, it's real serious athletic training. But also I was lifting, I was, I was powerlifting, I was lifting big weights. I was, I was very strong. I was training weekly. And when I got long COVID, it was such a, well COVID, but then it just didn't go away. And I would say it, it took me like nine months to even just get back on my feet yeah so just living independently because thankfully my mum was able to look after me for for quite a long period of time Amazing. and I think you know one of, one of the biggest things is it really made me realize lifting was such a big part of my connection with my body my way to manage stress my way to kind of feel sane <laughs> I think a lot of us turn to exercise and lifting in particular just as a way to to reconnect with our bodies and to and to let off steam. So having that kind of taken away as an outlet was really, really psychologically challenging. But then being able to get back into it, reframe the relationship I had with my body. And I think for the better, to be honest. Amazing. And at what point did you actually realise that you had long COVID? Was there a point where you felt like you were getting better or did it just was it just getting worse? When did it sort of become apparent? So it was it was just that my energy was out. The fatigue just didn't go away. So I lost my sense of smile, had terrible headaches. I was really fatigued. That just didn't go away. I remember calling the doctors and they said, you know, well, once it gets past 12 weeks, then we would consider that it's post-COVID syndrome. Yeah. So it got to that point and it went past that point and it was another 12 weeks and another 12 weeks. And it was really severe. I couldn't really walk up the stairs without having my heart totally racing and like need to lie down need to sit down first of all there was it just a big waiting game you just can't rush it yeah um I would say it was it was only at the like nine month point where I was consciously actually exercising and by that I mean walking around the park and then eventually going swimming which felt huge because I thought that wouldn't even be possible. You know, it's a disability. People, you become disabled overnight and it completely shifts the way that you you relate to yourself, you relate to your friends, you relate to the world. Thankfully, I'm in a really supportive long COVID group, which is really nice. Yeah. We have a WhatsApp group called Sick Times and that's been like an invaluable source of support, to be honest. Yeah, because I suppose whilst, while we were all relying on like our friend groups virtually, obviously having people going through the same thing is going to be so vital it's it's like that's your community that was your people nine months is such a long time and obviously a lot of people were just like chilling at home absolutely fine making a living Mm -hmm. what were you doing in those nine months that must have been so tough how did you get through your days so I mean every day is different there's an amazing essay called crip time you start living in like a different time zone really where actually I was sleeping for a lot of the days yeah. I was honestly like 14 hours just like flat and then I would kind of 
get up and, and do something and then I'd be <laughs> sleeping all night because I was just like I had nothing I had nothing in the tank you know but I think one of, one of the hardest things about it was it took my friends a while to clock on so I'd have some people who got it instantly and were like oh this is really tough I'm gonna send you a care package what do you need I'll, I'll come and drive to your mum's house and like let's spend time together let's hang out and then other people were like, oh, text me when you get better. Let me know when you're better and we can hang out. And it was really sad because I was like, I don't think I'm going to get better. I don't think better is even the, uh, the appropriate word here, actually. I don't, I don't think that's a relevant word. I'm not sick. I'm disabled. I can't predict what's going to happen to me in the future or if I'm going to be able to live the life that I once had. And it felt like, well, I'm probably going to lose some friendships because maybe our friendship was contingent on me being a different person to the one I am now, which was which was tough. Yeah. And maybe maybe also a sign that some of those people weren't necessarily your people, especially when we come from the music industry. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. I guess in that nine months, if it was a little bit of a blur, what was the first sign that you felt like you were recovering? OK, that is such a good question, because I just. So I would attempt to do this walk around the park, around the back of my mum's house. And it was honestly to what, like whether I could even get to the park. And then I just remember there was a day where not only did I get to the park without feeling like I need to, because I would, I would walk out of the house and I would walk down the road and I just need to sit down on the curb. And I'd be like, that's it, I'm done. Yeah. But I remember there was a time where like I was walking and then I got past this like lamppost that was like maybe a quarter of the park. And I was like, I think I can go past the lamppost. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just those little things. And I was walking so slowly. But yeah, I think it has just been baby steps. And pre previously, I had a very like command and control relationship with my body. I was like always pushing I, I didn't know where my limits were I was always pushing through I was operating on sleeplessness I was just you know pushing 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 my limits always going harder always adding heavier weight always like going to the point where I felt like oh I've got to stop now um and that had to completely change and I've definitely shifted into having more of a dialogue with my body because I have to because one of the biggest things about long COVID well the biggest thing about COVID and long COVID is we all thought it was a breathing and a lungs disease, but it's not. It's about your blood. It's it's cardiovascular and it's about your blood flow. And one of the most common conditions that comes after long COVID is a condition called POTS. And POTS is basically where your heart is just like on a mad one. It's the, the official test for it is when you're lying down and you go from go from lying down to standing up, does your heart increase more than 30 beats per minute? And that was a defining feature of my life for such a long period of time where I literally would stand up and feel like I was going to pass out and my heart would be thundering and I just have to lie back down again. So one of the biggest things around me re-relating to my body in a way that's in dialogue rather than me saying, we're going to do this now, it doesn't matter what the impact is, um, is really paying attention to my to my heart rate and to my breathing. Um and I got a Fitbit, I started monitoring my heart rate, I started monitoring my resting heart rate, and I started to get really in tune with that as, as the baseline, and that kind of is the baseline of all activity during the day, um, but I was not keyed into it before. Yeah, it's quite hard really, because I don't think any of us ever really thought about our heart rate that much until like smart technology came mm -hmm. along. But, you know, I have I have clients post top surgery that have Garmin's and that have whoop bands, if you've ever heard of those that yeah. give you your recovery, your readiness to train. And like, obviously, there's lots of inaccuracies, but like they're a measure of something. So having a measure yeah. of anything that's consistent can be so important. And yeah. you keep saying about dialogue, what ultimately was like the biggest change that you made when you just got back into your I guess I want to say everyday life, but it's obviously not been the yeah. same since you come back anyway. So it, it honestly has just been completely changing the pace in which I do things. And pacing is obviously like the number one thing all disabled people know to do to try and just like manage to get through the day. But for me, a lot of that was often kind of pacing in accordance to my heart rate because I would be 
for example, you know, I'd walk and then the next thing I did was swimming. But I remember I went swimming and it was it was like the most ridiculous thing. I went swimming and I felt great. And it's such a good way to get into exercise in general because you're just supported by the water. Yep. Um, it's very gentle. Well, if you go slow, some people take swimming very, very seriously. I don't. But I was just swimming along and I was like, oh, this is great. Like I've been in the pool for five minutes. This feels this feels like enough. And then I went to pull myself out and I like could barely get out of the pool. I just, it, like as soon as I went from the horizontal to the upright position, it was like all my blood was in my ankles. I thought I was going to pass out. I felt like I did not have the strength to like kind of pull myself up the ladder out of the pool. So I think, again, just shock to the system. But it was just like, OK, so when I'm swimming, factor in the energy I'm going to need to get out of the pool. So if that means I'm swimming for two minutes and then I have to save that extra two minutes to like have a little rest and then like go really slowly as I get out, that's the pace I've got I've got to go at. And then eventually, you know, I was swimming five minutes, 10 minutes and just resting, resting afterwards. And then when I eventually and I'm talking like about 16 months after I first had it, that was when I first tried to get back into weights and I had weights at home. I was just lying on my back. I was just doing floor press. I was doing floor press, hollow holds, and planks. That was me. Yeah. For my <laughs> because it's a measure though, and that's cool. It's it's small steps. That was it. And it, it, it was just like I realized that, you know, the kind of going from horizontal to standing up thing was really just like something I had to manage very, very carefully. And I just started getting my strength up, staying horizontal. And there's a lot you can do on your back, you know. There's a lot. Hundred <laughs> percent. Was there anyone? Did you work with anyone? Did you get guidance from anyone, or was this all a bit more intuitive for you, based on like your kind of training history and what you knew so far? Thankfully, I had a good knowledge. Like I had a personal trainer before when I was training, so like I had. A, I wasn't coming into into lifting fresh. So I kind of had a sense of, okay, what can I try that's not going to be too demanding? I mean, the worst thing that I could have done was squats because you're going like up, down, up, down, up, down. And when I, I remember when I tried to do squats, I was like, this is not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but eventually then when I did get back into training, I went back to my old trainer, Blake Knapp, who is a brilliant trainer. Yeah, they were good. Yeah, and a, and a super like disability inclusive. And it was very much like long rest times, go at my own pace. Their whole vibe is just anti-toxic athleticism. So it was it was a very comfortable journey back. But yeah, I was I was a long way off that when I first picked up those those five kg dumbbells on my floor press. So from that nine month mark to that 16 month mark where you went back into a gym, just slow and steady how how did that make you feel were you feeling frustrated or do you feel like you had like the right coping mechanisms and support system around you because it sounded like you had a really good setup and a lot of support which is amazing mm, yeah I had to make a lot of shifts in my diet that was a huge thing as well one of the biggest things with pots is like you got to stay hydrated more than you think and also you've got to just eat a lot of salt so I was like rinsing those multi packs of hula hoops. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I just I just remember like the summer being defined by hula hoop multi packs. Like there was just a lot of hula hoops in the house. And what's your favorite flavor? <laughs> Pretty salted. I'm so boring. Oh, I what? No, come on. <laughs> no, all barbecue beef. But like I do love a good ready salted. Yeah, no, they are great. I like the green ones. Are they like cheese and onion? Babes, I don't eat the green ones. Weird. <laughs> or am I weird? <laughs> I'm sorry for judging you on, on your hula hoop choices. Uh, so yes, yeah, so it was like staying hydrated, having loads of salt, just listening to my body and resting loads. And I mean, like you know, when I was when I first picked up weights again, it was like I would do three reps and then that was it for the day. But I think initially, there's so much grieving when you when you get long COVID because you you're cut off physically it's really isolating you know your body's not doing what you want it to do every day is different some days are better than others it's ultimately reckoning with a lot of powerlessness like you really have to confront powerlessness and grief and it's quite a painful journey because you you don't really have control over your body and I think like that was 
the hardest psychological step just recognizing and and really confronting the reality that you know I likely won't be able to lift again I likely won't be able to go back into a gym again so I think when I did manage to I was just in awe like I was I was amazed that I could even do that because I genuinely didn't think that I would be able to and I think that even continues continues to this day. The biggest thing about long COVID is that it's not linear. So I will still get energy crashes. I will still be fatigued, like, you know, just a couple of months. So we're in August now. In May, I basically didn't train for the whole of the month. I was flat out. I was really unwell. I was fatigued. I felt like I'd gone back to square one. I didn't have COVID. I felt like I might. I was testing. But that's really hard because you know that at any minute you can have a setback and you don't know how long it's going to last and you kind of have to ride it out. So yeah, there was frustration in the beginning, but then once I could do things that I thought I wouldn't be able to do, I was just so thankful for my body, you know, letting me do those things that day. Amazing. Yeah. And I think a lot of people that I train, a lot of people that listen to this podcast, I know live with chronic illnesses like myself, endometriosis. I work with a lot of people with endometriosis. Um, yeah you too a couple of people with fibro stuff like that who (laughs) can probably relate a lot to your struggles with long covid because it is a chronic illness isn't it 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 becomes your whole life and I think with a lot of us the way that we manage that like I've not trained for the last couple of weeks I literally just put a post up about it because I started a tour out had abdominal pain thought my appendix were going to burst on the first day then realized it was probably just more in endometriosis growing that that was confirmed and it's just like a lot of the time a lot of the time I have a good baseline with my training during flare-ups but this one just wiped me out and we can never prepare for that in the same way that you probably couldn't prepare for what happened to you in May it's it's really hard and the whole mindset piece around people that are living with different conditions like that it's it can be really really frustrating do you have any tools or any things that have sort of helped with like dealing with that over the last year or so honestly I think reading that crip time essay yeah really shifted things for me and and actually just accepting that my relationship to time and space and body is different to what you know capitalist society tells us which is you know produce constantly oh yeah go against your limits if you're feeling tired, drink some coffee, eat some sugar, do some cocaine, like do whatever you need to just get through by any means necessary. And that is so toxic. It's actually shocking that it, it took me to be flat out in bed for months on end to really challenge that way of thinking, because like everybody else in society, I'd, I'd internalized it. Yeah, I've talked so much about like grind and hustle culture on this podcast. So you're like so on on the nose of what you're talking about. Yeah. And like I've I've I felt the same at the point where we probably met each other and I was driving your band. I was saying yes to everything that that paid money because I yeah. felt like I had to be on the grind to mm-hmm. be able to live successfully as a self employed person. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. the like silliest thing about it was like I was struggling so much financially that even taking more on did not help. We're so used to going hard, going hard. And I'll have clients that come to me from other PTs that will apologize when they miss a workout. And I'm like, it's cool. I was, they were like, I'm really sorry, but I just really needed the rest. And I'm like, hell yeah. Well done for making that decision. Like maybe over the last few years, specifically, we've probably all inadvertently done a lot of work about like figuring out what our deep rest is and, you know, accepting that we don't have to be switched on and active and on that hustle train all the time and it's, it's not sustainable it, it wasn't sustainable for me back then um I've changed everything and it sounds like you have as well yeah to- I totally agree with you and I think you know recognizing that you need to rest and actually taking that rest not asking for that rest taking that rest is so countercultural, and it shouldn't be but that's the position that you find yourself in when you've reached a point of exhaustion. You you realize you have to take that rest because if you don't take it, you're the one who has to face the consequences. No one else does. Yeah, we're the ones that that causes issues to no one else around yeah. us, for sure. Mm-hmm. What do you do differently now to make sure you get that rest so you don't get to the point where it's your like burnout point? So I think a big thing for me is just is the pacing of everything in general. Like, being conscious of what I am able to fit into a day and like for example 
fit into a workout and planning long rests in between. So like previously what I would do is, you know, say I was on the barbell, I would be deadlifting and then in between sets, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to rest for like a minute and then I'll jump back into it. And then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to rest for as long as I want. Yeah. And sometimes that'll be 10 minutes and that's okay. And like my heart rate would go back down. I would drink some water. I would feel like, okay, we're good. We're ready to go again. And I felt good. And it just made me realize what was I racing towards? Like, what are we racing towards? Like death? It's so weird. Like how, how we're always just trying to rush to the next thing when actually, no, there's no reason why you can't just, you know, take that time and actually connect with your body and recalibrate and, and come in come in stronger, ultimately. 100%. And how, how do you adapt that when you've not got a lot of time to get a session in? What do you do to scale your workouts to keep the pacing there when you've got a short amount of time? I think that is just being mindful about being very intentional and mindful about the workouts that you're planning okay I'm gonna go really nerdy on the powerlifting now yeah. I'm going to Wendlist 531 um so it's you can you can look it up online I'm not gonna talk through everything but it is very much about doing your 70% of your one rep max often less than that and it's only reps of five on on like second week you're doing reps of three then you just make sure you've got an assortment of like push pull and core and I just plan workouts to be short and efficient and not kind of overexert and, and push myself to the point I've got like mad doms for two days. It's such a, like, you know, sometimes I like feeling like that, but most of the time it's not necessary to strength training, I don't think. No, I would totally agree. I think a lot of what I see in new people that I work with They'll often say, I don't think I, I don't think I did good enough on that session. Like I didn't, I didn't feel sore. And I'm like, no, that's cool. Like, that's fine. A lot of the time, the delayed onset muscle soreness, it's just coming from trying out new movement patterns. And obviously if you are pushing yourself too hard, then you will get them as well. But a lot of the time, you know, if you're in a new workout block and you're smashing it and you're pacing it right and you're scaling it right, then you aren't always going to get those doms. And, you know, that's not, that's not a bad thing. Not a bad thing at all. Yeah, and I think there's definitely this, you know, I follow a lot of gym memes and you see the videos of people like walking out the gym and falling over because they went too hard on leg day and it's quite troubling. <laughs> I just don't think it's necessary to train to that degree to be strong. Yeah, I think when when we're talking about people that have a job and a family and a social life and friends and stuff that they want to do that doesn't revolve around like everything training like yeah. you're not going to want to push your body to failure because what energy are you going to have for everything else outside of that it's not it's not really part of a sustainable lifestyle very different for athletes but there's also very few times that athletes are going to push themselves to a breaking point every day because that oh. would be counterproductive to their recovery so yeah lots to be said for scaling workouts and i feel like powerlifting because you obviously you loved your powerlifting anyway, it sounds like it's actually become such a perfect training style for you working in the lower rep range with more rest. And you've kind of adapted it, which is amazing. Yeah, I mean, listen, I was never a, a cardio person before. And I do think the like punk to powerlifter pipeline is very real. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I just feel like you know that's where you find the goths and it's really nice and I just you know I listen to low BPM music <laughs> I listen to metal I do my weights and I'm doing it in my own time and connecting to my body and that ultimately it is definitely a form of exercise that uh, I feel at home doing because I kind of always I, I did it before but especially if you're working out on your own or with a trainer something where you really can listen to your body and go at a pace that works for you and work with with weights and you can put down the heavy ones and you can pick up light ones or you can just do body weight but ultimately like showing up in that space for yourself is a commitment to to loving and caring for yourself in a world that relentlessly teaches you to do the opposite yeah that's amazing can i um can i ask you about your ted talk sure <laughs> i'm going on off on a tangent here your ted talk was that after you were coming out of long COVID. Yes. Yeah. And how did you feel about getting up on that stage and doing that after what you had been through? I will link your TED Talk in the show notes because everybody needs to watch. 
<laughs> you know what? It's it's really interesting because one of the things that I reference actually in the TED Talk is a, an incident where I had a really bad endometriosis flare up years and years and years ago. And I remember having absolutely stabbing pain around one of my ovaries. And it was actually so bad. I didn't know if it was endometriosis or a cyst or that was about to burst. Like, you know the pain I'm This was about. literally me last week. Yeah. <laughs> That, that pain and I ended up going to hospital because I was really worried I mean I, I could barely walk I couldn't stand up um I ended up going to hospital and I just remember being so stressed out in the hospital because I was meant to be writing a press release for a, a feminist protest the next day and I hadn't done it and I hadn't brought my laptop with me to the hospital and on reflection I have to laugh at the self-importance of of that <laughs> and how obviously it was my press release I was going to save the world but more concerningly it was the fact that Oh, I'm in so much pain and I can't walk, but the priority is this work that I'm not able to do. And that can't happen again. No. Like that, that, and will not happen again because my life has completely changed. But one of the, the big things that Level Up kind of prides itself on, so that's the organization I run, is we just have a very open nap culture where if we are tired, and this this had to be like a big part of me coming back to work was that I would be able to work for like an hour and then I was in bed again and I had to be really mindful of the types of work I could do because I couldn't really sit on a meeting for longer than half an hour I felt like I was going to pass out and I looked like I was going to pass out and it wasn't it wasn't helping anyone so taking loads and loads of naps and pacing throughout the week is actually not something that just I've been doing it's what everyone does in the team now and that's that's the team culture is pace yourself prioritize take the naps that you need at whatever point in the day. If you're not feeling well, just take the day off and recover before you get sick. And ultimately, you know, if something's super urgent, then you can hand it over to someone else. But most of the time, nothing is that urgent. We don't do frontline work. I think it's harder when you do frontline work where there is genuinely a risk to, to someone's life and you are managing quite stressful situations. We're not in that position, so we don't need to work to the level of urgency and ultimately self-importance that just is is counterproductive yeah and so bringing it back around like how did you feel when you finally got done with that TED talk was that like very much the culmination of like months of you recovering and then getting to do something like that was there any nerves about like your energy levels or how you would feel in the run-up because it's it's pretty stressful it's pretty nerve-wracking you're a person that has been on the stage a lot that has public talked a lot but there is I I don't know there's something about the stature of it for for sure that must be a bit nerve-wracking yeah it was nerve-wracking it's funny because I felt like, okay, you know, six years being in a feminist punk band really prepared me for this because whenever I used to feel like nervous about a show, I would always just say, Janie, it's not about you, it's the message that you're there to deliver. And that really came back into play for the TED Talk where I was like, these people don't know me, it's nothing to do with me. Like, this is about a message that I've got to deliver. And it really helped that I was doing it with Shay, my co-director, so we could bounce off of each other. Yeah. And we, we rehearsed it so many times that we knew each other's lines. If anyone paused or forgot anything, we were ready to jump in. So I felt incredibly supported by her. But yeah, I mean, I cleared everything that week and then I went straight to bed afterwards. <laughs> the adrenaline mashed me up. The adrenaline, I was like, whew, I am tired there is no after party for me <laughs> yeah fair play I definitely notice these days I'm very happy to be back in a hotel room after a show if there's an early curfew I'm not gonna lie <laughs> you, know, you know what the biggest thing I remember so last year I won a Kerrang award and you did the- let's let my god that, that was sick what was that for please tell everyone activism. I know what it was for it was so sick it was like the sickest thing it was activism because obviously I did vocals on that petrol girl song yep um, about femicide and like one of the big areas of activism that I do is around femicide and then the Kerrang editor had seen heard the song seen it and thought this is actually really important why don't we at the Kerrang Awards introduce a new award for like recognizing activists and people within the movement and I was the first person to win that award but coming back to the point yes I just remember at the ceremony so it kind of like everything all the speeches and everything kind of ran from about 7 till 9 p.m and then you better believe all the musicians left the room and it was just like PR managers all the people kind of 
associated and part of the infrastructure of the industry, but not the artists themselves. The schmoozers, <laughs> the lanyards. The, the begs, the hangers on. No, um, all the musicians were exhausted because we often are. I think like so many of us are introverted. So many of us, you know, we care about the music. We care about the message and we want to do the thing on the stage and then kind of run and hide. <laughs> yeah, and often a lot of the time in our circles, we're not just doing the music and the performance, just like oh, wow. you're not just doing the activism. There's so much behind the scenes and all that stuff is often the more emotionally and physically laborious stuff for sure. Mm -hmm. Like, but, you know, well done, Kerrang, for giving an activism award like that's pretty good going for them I mean it, you know there's a bare minimum and that probably is it but <laughs> 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 we'll take it um it definitely yeah it, it felt good to kind of be in that space um full of like music industry blokes and and just talk about like sexism and misogyny that was that was a nice moment to have Mike yeah guest areas award shows uh guest areas at festivals specifically are my favorite places and that's my friends are in <laughs> um, yeah. Janie can I ask you how are you feeling now is you say two years and two weeks mm -hmm. uh since that first time you caught COVID it has been a long fucking way to where you are now where are you up to how are you Oof, what a big question. I'm sorry, very loaded. Was it loaded? It's, I don't know. It's a, great, it's a great question. Honestly, it just, I've really come to just move day to day. And I think for a while on practical terms, that honestly meant I just didn't make any plans for the future because I, I often had to cancel them because I couldn't get out of bed. But I've really just come to appreciate the support of my friends, the support of my long COVID group, um, and and recognize that everyone living with chronic illness is honestly a hero like there's there's so many of us and often I just when I'm in bed and I spend a lot of time in bed like I'm by no means you know out of my bed all day and then be, being the kind of like typical functional able-bodied person like I still I nap a lot I spend a lot of time in bed and sometimes I just like imagine as if it was like a drone like I'm in my bed and all these other people are in their beds and like we're all just in our beds in this like hyper productive culture that tries to make you feel terrible about yourself if you're not like participating and actually it's cliche to say like yeah resting is resistance but in a lot of ways it genuinely is and we're, we're all out here you're, you're you know when you're in it you feel lonely and you feel like you're the only one you feel really isolated but we're really not there's so many of us and I just try and, and draw on remembering that, you know, I'm not I'm not the only one feeling powerless or fatigued or like unable to to live up to often my own expectations. There's there's so many of us who are kind of carrying that and and we're all amazing. Yeah, hundred percent. And like you're you're a really ambitious person. Like you got you got shit to do, you got plans. And it can be hard to have to sort of challenge yourself on the rest bar I find it really really hard especially on the weeks where I have big endo flare-ups and yeah like standing up is not, not an option like talking on camera is not an option making content is not an option and mm -hmm. I feel like I am just forever I am forever doing the work on that to like give myself grace and self-compassion and it's something I talk about a lot with all of my people as well. And it's something that always doesn't always have a place in the in the society we live in, which is a shame. But luckily we have people like you and more compassionate kind of people in this industry that understand and like your working culture sounds wicked as well, which again, a lot of people don't always seem to have based on what sector of the industry either they're definitely not. And also I mean activist organizations and charities can be some of the worst for really ruling working conditions because you feel like the cause that you're all fighting for is so big and urgent that you can't afford to take a day off but in reality none of us can afford to burn out like the, the cause can't afford for us to burn out yeah. one of the things that I have to regularly kind of say to myself is you're not that important like it's all right the world is not going to end if you can't do this thing there is someone else who who can pick that up and you've got to trust in the bigger movement that you know we're, we're all doing what we can when we can yeah it can be hard to sort of relinquish that control and also be like it's not just you even though at times sometimes a lot of the time that stuff can make us feel pretty lonely um so i was about to ask you for any tips that for anyone that works for like 
activist organizations or charities that can feel pressure and is worked pretty hard but I think that was maybe the best most valuable thing you may could have said (laughs) that and join a union (laughs) (laughs) join a union make sure that you have flexible working uh, policies in place whether you're disabled or have a chronic illness or you or you're not just like actually make sure those things are in place because cultivating a, a culture of care is is on everybody it shouldn't have to just be for sick people to be advocating for ourselves and each other which it often is everyone benefits from from flexible working life happens everyone benefits from being honest about when they need to rest rather than you know having all the sugar and caffeine which makes you feel terrible I think we, we all benefit from being able to take care of each other and also means that we're showing up more authentically at work which makes work less less of a an ordeal yeah to be and the more of that deep rest we have the more of that time to ourselves for our own self-care that we have we're going to show up better in all of the other spaces for mm-hmm. you know family friends work activism everything my dog is crying so i'm just gonna bring her in i've got to like episode nine and this is the first time she has cried to come in so she and you missed me oh Aubrey. <laughs> but quickly i just want to say on the self-care thing i honestly think like it has to be about it has to be about collective care because i think the kind of self-care discourse has really morphed in the last decade it came about and it was really radical and it's like oh we need to take care of ourselves but I think often that meant you do your thing to take care of yourself, but the broader systems that are exhausting you and making everyone sick stay in place when actually like so much of kind of collective care is, is changing those systems. I think it, we, we really have to show it for each other. And this is something that, you know, black and disabled feminists have been saying for, for decades. I think the pandemic was a real turning point for, for a lot of people. Others, it seems like they left it behind and they don't think COVID is a thing anymore, but... It very much is. And, you know, being able to show up and and rely on each other gives us more trust in the world, which ultimately makes us all tangibly safer. Yeah, we could all do with a bit more of that for sure. Like before you leave us, can I ask how it's feeling being in your new band and how it's going to feel eventually being on a stage again? I'm so excited. I'm so excited. It feels really good to be in a band with such like, kind cool people and we just have such a good laugh because so everyone in the band has been in bands before if any punks are listening it's Robin Gatt from Personal Best on guitar Laura Ankles from every band there's ever been and then Jodie Byrne on drums and everyone is just brilliant and the songs are a good mix of political and joyful and fun and it's it's just good vibes. Making music with sweet babes is my favourite thing to do. Hell yeah. And Ro- Robin will be on here at some point soon. I'm just waiting for them to Yay! confirm that date. I've yeah, got a lot of people who obviously like listen to my bands and know my history. So um, I will put all the info about Jamie's new band in the show notes. I am very, very excited for you to eventually come through to lead. Have you tried singing much since post-COVID? How are the lungs? Oh, yeah. I mean, I love singing. It's definitely been like an exercise in breath control for sure. And like, I do feel a bit nervous about live shows again, because when I was performing before, I did not have long COVID. But I think hopefully with with prep and pacing and care on the fact that punk shows are relatively short, <laughs> um, it will all go very well. Yeah, I'm sure there's so much that you can do in terms of like your set list and like how your band members like show up to support you as well. That will be that will make it the perfect environment for that. So hell yeah. Nice. Thank you so much for joining Janie and me for a little bit of a catch up and some chat about long COVID. If this podcast has helped you in any way, please share it with a friend put it on your instagram stories it honestly helps me so so much especially as i'm new in the podcast game still not 10 episodes yet 10 next week anyways have an awesome weekend cultivate family take it easy i'm out